Good afternoon all and welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Pinellas County's Native Orchids. Uh, my name is James Stevenson and I am coming to you by way of the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Yes, an institute right here in Pinellas County. We're a cooperative, we're sometimes known as the co-op, a cooperative agreement between the University of Florida and Pinellas County government, providing our good citizens uh, free information on the world around them, be it the economic world, the nutritional world, um, your lawn and garden, or natural resources in the case of today's presentation, the native orchids of our county. I'm situated in Brooker Creek Preserve, a 9,000 acre bit of our tiny little overly developed county up here in the north side, uh, put aside its preserve, its land that's been put aside for the preservation of our native plants and animals. As I mentioned, the Institute um, covers a, a variety of topics. Our specialty areas and our faculty are in place to address issues like natural resources, horticulture, which I am not. Uh, we have a Sea Grant agent uh, who specializes in the concerns with coastal, with our coastal areas, sea level rise, of course, red tide, um, development, all these sorts of things. Urban sustainability, the way that we can proceed through time uh, without overusing our resources and providing a, a pleasant life for all the inhabitants here. And finally, families and consumer sciences, which is basically a fancy way of saying home economics. So it's all to do with nutrition, uh, the prevention of pre preventable diseases like diabetes, home economics, literally uh, forming budgets for households. And all this information is provided through, free through the University of Florida via various um, outreach efforts like the one you're tuning into today with regards to natural resources. So raising awareness of the natural resources of our county hopefully will um, inspire participants of programming such as this to become involved in their protection. Appreciation brings you know, adoration, which could lead to protection and so on. So that's why we do what we do. I mentioned I'm not a horticulturist and that's someone else's milieu. If you're here today to learn how to grow the pretty orchids, I can't really help with that. I try, I do, but it's my job to observe these things living on their own in the wild, taking care of themselves and thriving on what nature has bestowed upon them and what they have evolved to cope with. So I hope that's not a, a put off for anyone here. Now we've all heard of orchids. Fancy, fancy, fancy orchids. Corsages, expensive, cursive writing, you know, orchids. Look how delighted this lady is. She's so happy to get this fancy bouquet of these expensive, pretty, pretty flowers probably everybody's idea of an orchid. Here's one of my favorites growing in a stagnant pond of smelly water. This is the water spider orchid. Not glamorous, but lovely to the beholder. So orchids are a huge group of plants. They're all related. All orchids are related to one another. They all have a common ancestor. So all the known orchids that we have today are derived from a successful population somewhere in the mists of the distant past. So what makes an orchid an orchid? What separates an orchid from say, lawn grass or an orchid from one of the oaks? Well, orchids are specialized. They are seed plants. They do reproduce by seed. So they're not spore producing plants. They're flowering plants. Obviously, they're known for their quite 
often extravagant flowers. They belong to one of two groups of the flowering plants, the monocots. You might remember, I don't even know if they teach it anymore, but they used to teach it in like ninth grade. There were monocots and dicots, and the monocots were like the grasses and the palm trees, and the dicots were the sunflowers and everything else. Anyway, they belong to one of two groups of flowering plants. And within the monocots, they're actually related to a group called the asparagales. Does that sound familiar? Asparagus? Yes. So an orchid is related to, amongst all of the monocots, it's within a smaller subset called the asparagales. And the orchids are one of two of the largest groups, families, in fact, of flowering plants with 28,000 species, 28,000 different kinds of orchids. Not counting all the crazy stuff that we've done to them by hybridization, just in the wild, there are close to 30,000 different wild orchids around the world. And their distribution is quite impressive as well. We'll take a look at that. So that's kind of how where orchids sit in the scheme of things. But what makes an orchid an orchid? Let's drill down a little bit further into that. Well, by definition, orchids at some point in their life, most if not always when rega with regards to the seed germination, orchids are dependent on a fungal association. So orchids can't do it all on their own. They're so incredibly specialized that they need these kind of co-hosts, as it were, in order to get through life successfully. And they have evolved, they have adapted to allow for fungal associations as a normal, natural, and um, essential part of their life. We often hear, oh no, it's got a fungus, it's gonna die. In, in the case of orchids, they actually depend on a fungal association for their success. One of the things that fungus can help certain orchid species with is water and nutrient absorption because the orchids have lost their root hairs, which are extensions of the cell walls of plant roots. So if you go down underground and find a root of a plant, Look for the individual cells that that root tissue is made up of on the outside layer. The cell wall is extended to increase the surface area and that extension is called a root hair because they look very hair-like, but organs don't have them. So they often have this fungal association that acts like that extra surface area and is actually plumbed into the orchid plant tissue itself. They do have roots, they just don't have those extension of those root cells. Orchid flowers, as a group, orchid flowers twist 180 degrees in their development. So when we see an orchid, like the one right behind me here, that bottom lip actually originated during the development of the flower bud, that petal was on top. But during the developmental process, the flower twisted 180 degrees so that when it finally opened, it's in this position. All the petals are free. They're not fused into a tube. And by that, I mean, if you can in your mind picture a petunia flower, if you pick that petunia flower, you get a, you get a little tube. All the petals are fused together into a tube. Another example might be a morning glory where you see it looks like a, a flared kind of trumpet shaped flower. All the petals are fused into that tubular shape. Well, in orchids, all the petals are separate from one another. You could pluck a petal off and the rest of the flower would stay intact. That petal that began at the top and ended up pointing downwards, that's a specialized petal, unique to or not unique to orchids, but throughout the orchid family. One petal is specialized into what's known as a labellum, kind of a exaggerated lip. Uh, it's kind of like a landing pad. And if you see again, the, 
the, the orchid behind me, you can see the little heart-shaped spot on the labellum of this orchid. And the labellum on this orchid on our slide here, this snake's head, you can see it's quite elaborate. That labellum very often is modified to help guide the pollinator towards the pollen sac. So the pollinator will get where it needs to go and nowhere else. Once the flower, once the fertilization, once pollination has taken place, once that pollinator has found its way into the flower, picked up the pollen sac and deposited it somewhere else, the fruit begins to develop. And that fruit is a dry seed pod. And when it's ripe, it splits open along six little valves. So you, you end up with kind of like a, a, a dried shaker and the seeds are like dust. Orchid seeds are so highly specialized and produced in such great numbers. They're like dust. And they lack any nutrition for their developing embryo. It's just like an embryo in a paper bag. Microscopic. That's all you get for orchid seeds. A lot is left to chance. And a lot of times because the seeds don't have an embryo, that's where this association with the fungus comes into play. Because in order for an orchid embryo to be successful, it needs to eat. It needs to get that first bit of nutrition so that it can begin to grow into the next orchid plant, eventually producing leaves that can photosynthesize and feed the entire structure. But many species depend on that fungal association to provide the initial nutrient. In turn, the fungus gets a place to live within and around the root system of the orchid. Of course, without harming it, they're co-evolved to coexist, as it were. So here in the upper left, we have this microscopic orchid seed associating itself with these um, fungal tissues that eventually feed the embryo. Photosynthesis takes over and we all lived, we all live happily ever after, right? This is an example of one of our native orchids. This is our native ghost orchid. It's not the famous ghost orchid or infamous ghost orchid, uh, but it's a ghost orchid nonetheless. It's one that doesn't produce any leaves. It just produces flowers seemingly out of nowhere. But you can see it's using its roots to hold on to the tree. This is an epiphytic species. And there's no root hairs present on the roots of this orchid or other orchids. The outside of the root is thickened and is velvety. Uh, the substance that that root is made of is actually referred to as the velamen, V-E-L-A-M-E-N, and it, it increases the surface area like root hairs do. But in the case of the ghost orchid, it's also responsible for photosynthesis. There's chlorophyll embedded in the roots of this particular species, this epiphytic species, because there's no leaves to do the job. So we'll take a look at this particular species again a little bit later. As I mentioned, the flowers twist during their development. And on the left, we have the butterfly orchid, uh, Encyclia tampensis. And you can see this one has twisted during its ontology, during its development, putting the labellum on the bottom, kind of as a place for the pollinator to walk up through. But this species on the right, the bearded grass pink, here's an example of an orchid that defies the orchid rule and does not rotate 100 degrees during its ontology. And that labellum stays right where it developed. And in this case, it's pointing upward. And it no longer acts as that um, runway light. It no longer serves as an arrow towards the pollen. Uh, 
will tell you what this labellum is modified into. It's actually quite sinister. We'll tell you what this labellum is modified into when we address this particular species. So generally speaking, and nature loves to throw in the exceptions, you can't make definitives oftentimes. See, I just did it, not making a definitive. Anyway, orchids most often twist during their development. Again, the petals not fused into a tube. You can see those free petals pretty well displayed here. Again, here's the spelling of that specialized petal, the labellum. The fruit, here we have the, I believe this is one of the butterfly orchids. You can see that the developing seed pod here, you, the crumpled up piece of crumpled up brown paper that's still attached, that's what's left of the flower. Uh, the ovary, part of the flower has swollen up into the fruit. The fruit in this case, developing into the seed pod, dry seed pod that split open to release the little um, scale-like seeds. They're just like dust. Here, an individual seed. Like I said, it's just like an embryo inside of a paper husk. Very, very basic and produced in the millions. But orchids are successful despite the fact that they have all these specializations that seem like it would make life more difficult, that specialization and that adaptation and the cooperation with whatever species of fungus has actually led to quite a proliferation of species. As we mentioned before, close to 30,000 different kinds. And here's the distribution. They're not all steamy jungle plants. Circumboreal. What is that? Greenland? Orchids in Greenland? Yes. All over the continent of Australia, from the tropical north down to the temperate um, southern Atlantic lashed coastline of Tasmania and New Zealand. Um, all but the Arctic region of South America. So orchids have adapted and developed and thrive all over the world. There's hardly anywhere that orchids do not exist. Growth habits, again, having so many members of this family of plants, they live pretty much everywhere. Some live epiphytically. We saw the ghost orchid using its roots to hang on to another plant. That's called an epiphyte, living on another plant, not living off of, not parasitic, but epiphytic, just living on, perched on another plant. Terrestrial, actually rooted into the ground, like most plants are. We have already seen, and we'll meet again, the aquatic, the fully aquatic floating orchid, lithophytic, does anyone know what that means? What lith means? Lithography. Stone. So there are some orchids that live on stones. They can use their roots to hang on to the surface of stones. Now, Florida isn't really known for its stony topography. There are some areas where limestone is exposed somewhere you know up and down the the lake wales ridge and in other places there are some limestone outcrops so we do have opportunity to have some lithophytic species represented in florida but not that many and some are huge 10 25 dollar word myco heterotrophic i mentioned early that most orchid species have a dependency on a particular species of fungus, the mycoheterotrophs have gone, have just kind of given it up. They've given up everything about life, given it over to the fungus. These used to be called parasitic because the thought was these orchids were actually parasitizing the tree species that they might be found growing under, when in fact it's a fungus that's acting like a bridge between the tree and the orchid and the orchid is depending on the fungus to provide the nutrient to make it grow we'll take a look at uh, one or two examples of a mycoheterotrophic species so an epiphytic the tampa butterfly orchid and here this is a photograph of one of our 
larger populations that you can see along the boardwalk here at Brooker Creek in June when these things flower. It looks something like a swarm of bees uh, buzzing around this tree branch. Those are the individual flowers. And it's using its roots, again, just to hang on. Epiphytes, they're not parasites, they're epiphytes. They're just hanging on. And if you, if you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about epiphytes and it's a lifestyle. It's not a, it's not a take, it's just a take advantage of being up in the sun. There's no parasitism going on here. Terrestrial, doesn't need explanation. Here we have one of our rain orchids, R-E-I-N, not raining down, but like the reins of a horse. Being terrestrial, this one loves to burn. You can see it's growing here uh, in the pine duff, the pine needles, very flammable. The saw palmettos, fire adapted. This orchid too loves to burn after it flowers, of course. Here's an, again that gorgeous aquatic orchid, the water spider, an aquatic lifestyle for an orchid. A photograph taken actually from not our library of an example of a lithophytic species. Um, here using its roots to hold on to a rock, underscoring that these species aren't parasitizing anything. These orchids aren't parasitizing the rock they're growing in any more than the Tampa butterflies are parasitizing the branch that they're living on. And an example of the mycoheterotroph used to be called parasitic, but now we know that it's a fungal association that allows these to grow, uh, the coral root orchid. And these you won't meet in Pinellas County. These are a more temperate species that you will find in the panhandle and northward, growing in deciduous forests. Most of our exposure to orchids comes when we first walk in the door of the grocery store, or so it seems. And again, orchids are treated as these exotic things that need special, special care. And in recent years, thanks to a drop in the cost of production and an increase in production has brought down the price of these things. And now you can pretty much get them for 10 bucks or less in flour. And they come with the instructions to put an ice cube. Have you heard this? I said I'm not a horticulturist, but I have to advocate just for a second please don't don't put ice cubes on your orchids unless you have one of these species that might be native to northern Greenland it's just not nice if you want to give them an ice cubes amount of water how about melt that ice cube and bring it up to room temperature and then pour it on I just needed to do that let's move on to the subject of today's lecture Pinellas native orchid species. Oh, somebody wants to know why? How would you like it if somebody put an ice cube on your roots? That. Mm -hmm. Pinellas native orchid species will start with that special exception to the rule that we looked at a little bit earlier, the bearded grass pink. This is a terrestrial species and in fact the majority of our Pinellas County native orchids are terrestrial. They actually come up and grow out of the ground. Um, this terrestrial species does not, is not resupinate. It does not twist during its ontology. So the labellum is pointing upwards. And you can see that the labellum is pointing upwards and you can see it's got this little tuft. It's got this little beard. The beard is meant to look like the pollen bearing structures of other flowers. Do you know what I mean? If you were to look at a big flower, you could see the pollen bearing structures and they're very often yellow and they're very often kind of fuzzy looking. 
like this fake beard on the bearded grass pink. But that is not pollen. It's a ruse. The lip, the labellum of the bearded grass pink is hinged. So at the bottom of this petal, all the way where it, here it is in the background, if you were to trace this petal back to where it attaches itself, where the other petals are attached, it's hinged. And a naive insect looking for pollen, because insects know that where you find pollen, you're very often going to find nectar. So here come this red dot is going to be our insect and sees something that looks very much like pollen bearing structures. And it knows if it just heads towards these things, it's going to find some nectar, but it doesn't because these are not, this is just a fake outgrowth of the labellum. It's not, it's not real pollen bearing structure, but the insect lands on this and the weight of the insect pulls it down onto this little concave structure here where the pollen sac is located. So basically the flower slams the pollinator down onto the pollen sac and the thing doesn't even know what's going on. It just suddenly falls backwards and bonk, picks up the pollen sac, didn't get a nectar reward, doesn't know what's up, flies off, tries again on another flower and whap, bonk, transfers that pollen sac to another flower, thus facilitating pollination, fertilization. Insect ends up with nothing. So the bearded grass pink plays tricks on insects. And it's thanks to that untwisted labellum. We have a couple of different species here in Pinellas County. Uh, they look, you can see why they're in the same genus. These are both calipogon. Uh, pallidus means pale. Barbatus means having a beard. Uh, they both have that ruse. You can see the pallidus, uh, the little hairs aren't quite as yellow tipped as they are in Barbatus. Also the lateral petals, the ones that stick out on either side, they're kind of raised up um, in Pallidus, um, the person who showed us this population said they look like they're cheering um, with their little petals raised up on either side, whereas in Barbados, they're more uh, reached out to the side. We were lucky here at Brooker to come across a population of this terrestrial orchid that had a Barbados, the bearded grass pink, uh, where a couple of individuals were pure white. And apparently this is very unusual. So we had to hide, we had to, um, we had photographs of this on our phone. We had to turn off our GPS so that if anybody ever saw the picture, they wouldn't know where the picture was taken because people are horrible and they would go out and use the GPS data to go and dig these things up uh, because they're so special. But here for your um, appreciation, amusement, I don't know, enjoyment, a photograph of this unicorn of uh, bearded grass pinks. Here's another good picture that I didn't take of one of our Brooker Creek bearded grass pinks. And you can see a little bit better just how an insect might be fooled into thinking that there's pollen here. And if there's pollen, there's nectar. Well, there isn't. This is that hinge that's going to slam the pollinator onto the pollen bag that's here. No nectar produced. No, nothing, just a trick played on the pollinator. Next species, uh, needle root air plant orchid. We call it the ghost orchid. Um, it's actually a lot more abundant than originally thought. They're just really hard to see. They're nothing but just like dried up green spaghetti thrown up on, on, on the branch of a tree. There's hardly anything to it. Um, the roots, of course, are photosynthetic because it doesn't produce leaves. And it's referred to as a ghost orchid because out of nowhere, suddenly flowers are produced. And to give you a sense of scale, um, the picture on the right here, there's your presenter being very creepy, um, sneaking up behind the very first one of these plants that I'd ever seen in my life out here in the wild. Thought it was, again, thought it was a unicorn. 
since then, we find them all over the place. They're everywhere. Um, the outsized fruit, those dry seed pods that split along six uh, seams, you can see those are persistent until the very last dust-like seed has drifted out onto the wind, hopefully landing on a tree branch that's suitable for germination. Uh, in flower, the flowers are vanishingly small. Um, those outsized fruit are still only about as big as uh, a nice English garden pea. They're about that size. That's what size the fruit is. So the flower is so much smaller than that. Likely pollinated by a fly, such as a midge or even a mosquito. Yes, mosquitoes are pollinators. When you make your pollinator garden, don't overlook the mosquitoes. They are very important pollinators. They might be pollinating these little needle root ghost orchids. But despite the small size of this and the lack of leaves, this is an orchid because it fits all those other descriptors and it has the common ancestor of all the other species that we're looking at today. Our most famous, our most easy to spot, um, the Florida butterfly orchid. This is Encyclia tampensis. It's actually named after our very own Tampa. Tampa is not named after the orchid. The orchid is named after Tampa, um, is, but it is very widespread. It's common this far north, but as you go further south, it's just everywhere. If you really want to see a show, go to the Mayaka River State Park in June. It's worth slogging through the flooded forest. The trees are absolutely dripping with this species and they're all flowering in all their various color forms in June. They have that very distinctive labellum with the red spot on the labellum. Otherwise, the flowers are kind of a, a greenish brown and they're very fragrant. So they might be attractive to insects that can detect chemicals like odors in the air, like moths. Although I have seen little uh, metallic bees um, with the pollinia stuck to their forehead, which is expertly placed when they visit the next flower, crawl down the labellum towards the nectar reward, and then they have that po pollen sac ripped off their forehead, facilitating the fertilization of the ovary of the other flower, then growing into the fruit, as you see here. These, this is the stage that these plants are in. From now through the end of the year, they'll shed their seeds. They'll actually develop all winter long and shed their seeds ahead of next year's rainy season. A newcomer to the scene uh, is a non-native species that's actually coming up everywhere. And I say everywhere. Um, everywhere, it seems that mulch has been put down. The Chinese crown orchid, uh, Eulophia graminea, I have collected specimens in the parking lot of Publix. Not growing out of the asphalt, but just about. Growing out of the mulch in those um, little island beds that are kind of scattered throughout parking lots all over. Um, this is one that we get sent photographs of. This orchid just showed up out of nowhere and it's beautiful and I really want to have it. I want to take, I want to grow it. Um, this has, in the short time that it has been recorded in Florida, has become a number one, number one invasive plant, like as bad as the worst. Um, it has a very distinctive swollen pseudo bulb. It would even, you'd be forgiven for calling this thing a bulb. It's big. They can get to be about as big as a soft ball. Helps with survival in very, very dry times. The flowering stems, very tall and slender. Graminia, in fact, means like grass. And of course, in close up, you can see just how it's related to all of its kin. It's a pretty thing. It's an orchid, um, but it does come up in great numbers and it's bomb proof. Here it is growing up 
in someone's driveway. And again, the seeds like dust, they can show up anywhere, anywhere that's suitable, but it seems to be being transported around in loads of mulch. Here's just one plant and all these flowering stalks. If you do the math, don't do the math in your head, but just imagine each one of these hundreds of little flowers is going to create that seed pod with thousands of seeds inside that are like dust and just going to poof out and drift across the landscape. Obviously has an association with a very, very widely abundant fungus or doesn't have a particular species of fungus that it needs to enmesh with in order to survive. So a very successful, definitely keeping our eye on. And if you do encounter this plant, we do recommend getting rid of it. And if you're curious, if you want a proper identification before you do anything, you're free to email myself or the horticulture department at Extension. That's exactly what we're here for. We're not, we're not here to sell you anything. We're not going to sell you something to get rid of it with. We're just going to properly identify it and give you the uh, option of how you're going to get rid of that thing. A native species changing track. Um, the habaneras, uh, the tooth petal false rain orchid, worst common name ever. Um, a green flowered orchid um, that has a very sweet odor. Some authors, when you read a description of this, will claim that the odor is of rotten meat and thus would suggest being pollinated by something like a fly that would be attracted to rotting meat. Other authors claim that the scent of this orchid is actually very sweet, which might suggest that it produces a chemical that would be recepted, received by something like a moth with, a, with excellent chemoreceptors. I have sat in a car with this as a cut flower. This author would describe the scent as very sweet. So sniff for yourself and see what you think. It's a terrestrial orchid. It flowers in winter. So it flowers after the rainy season. So they're beginning to show their leaves now. We're, believe it or not, coming to the end, towards the end of our rainy season. And they'll flower throughout the winter, shed their seeds ahead of next year's rainy season. And here you can see the individual little green flowers. And we described the landscape where this one was growing before that's pretty regularly burned. One of its relatives, however, has adapted to life floating in water. And that's the water spider orchid that we've met twice before. And it's kind of always in flower. As long as there's water, it's going to keep flowering. If, if this little water hole dries up, it's going to rest, wait out, the, wait out the drought. And then when that water hole fills back up, it's going to start sending up flowering stalks. Uh, water spider, it's got uh, the petals. You can almost see in this photograph, the petals are very spindly, like spider legs. Here, it's actually growing amongst um, an invasive water hyacinth. Uh, this is a photograph that I took not far, not actually in the preserve, but might as well be uh, kind of across Keystone and a little bit uh, east of here. That's my thumb in the picture there, proving that it was actually taken by a dumb human. Um, and these rafts of this floating orchid have established themselves completely free from land. So quite a feat. Um, I'm very happy to be very fond of this orchid, so I've included several pictures of it. But you get the idea. Believe it or not, there's an aquatic orchid species, the water spider orchid. The giant orchid, like many, if not all, with the exception of the invasives, um, threatened. Lots of orchids are so specialized that they've specialized into habitat type and habitat destruction means no more place for orchids to grow. The giant orchid is one of these that has adapted to a lot of these fire dependent communities and in the absence of fire they don't get what they need to come up and grow. It's called the giant orchid 
orchid, um, which might be relative because this is my boss, Lara, and she's taking a picture of the giant orchid. It's variable. Here is the presenter with a more typical growing specimen of the giant orchid. And on the right, you can see the hooded flowers, the little hoods here, um, and the side petals kind of point up like demonic toothpicks or something like that. Again, you can see it's a terrestrial species in fire dependent communities. So as the fires are prevented from moving through areas, the undergrowth covers up the areas where these would normally grow. In wetter areas, away from the uplands, away from the pines and the saw palmettos, as you get more down into the more acidic, more boggy areas, you'll see the snake mouth orchid if there's fire. So even though these areas during most of the summer are boggy and wet and soggy, in the dry season, the water is gone, the rains have stopped, the water has retreated, all the uh, leaves of last year's grasses and orchids and everything else are just lying on the ground, very easily burned off. And once a, a very cool fire has gone through one of these marshy areas, you begin to see proliferations of species like the snake mouth orchid, um, very often grown found growing in association with the carnivorous plants. They like the same conditions, seasonally flooded, seasonally wet, always boggy, always marshy, um, very acidic uh, conditions. You can see the variety in the different flower colors of the same species, just like we saw with the bearded grass pink. We had white, pink, and very dark pink. Uh, these were all growing in the same little area uh, with the variety of flower colors. All the same species, despite that variation. Another terrestrial, the leafless beaked ladies tresses, another gruesome common name. Um, looking very much like a popular garden plant from temperate areas, the red hot poker, if you're familiar with that one, looks similar, not closely related at all. Um, very abundant on roadsides south of here. In Brooker, we find it again in kind of mucky areas, um, growing with grasses, kind of grasses and sedges and rushes and reeds you get it you get the idea the kind of wet grass like the graminoids that it grows with the individual flowers are tubular even though remember orchid petals aren't fused together into that tube they're not like a morning glory or a petunia but in this case all the petals kind of overlap each other into this tubular shape that invites the pollinator into the flower to get the nectar reward. And in this case, there actually is a nectar reward. There's no fooling around, um, but they do get dusted with that pollen on their way out. Um, just another photograph, you can see distinctively the, the kind of velvety texture of the flowering stalk here. Um, it's one of the ladies' tresses, common name ladies' tresses. Tresses are curls, I think. The individual flowers kind of spiral around the stem. Other orchids with the same common name ladies' tresses, although a different genus, this one is spiranthes, which literally translate to spiral flowers. Spiranthes vernalis, which means of the spring, and Spiranthes praecox, which means of the spring. It's not my fault. I didn't make up the language. I didn't give these things their names. Two different species, praecox, vernalis, they look more alike than different, not to worry exactly about who's who. 
but if you see these very bright white corkscrew flowers coming up on roadsides, especially in ditches around Easter time, springtime, you're probably seeing the ladies tresses orchids. Where they're found, they can be very um, abundant. So you might see quite a lot of ladies tresses in a particular area. Individual flowers, very, very small. Again, they would have tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, pollinators. Maybe our native bees, uh, maybe gnats, moths, very, very small, small pollinators for the ladies tresses. Possibly a very easily overlooked. Um, the gentian nodding caps. I have seen this plant only around buildings. I have never, not that I've been in every square inch at every time of the year all over the state by any stretch of the imagination, but I have happened to see this plant growing around buildings. So this is another whether it's native or not is kind of in debate, uh, but it's certainly adapted itself to mulch and being moved around in mulch. And where it pops up, you can see these very hmm, nondescript, but they fit the bill of being an orchid. They're put together like all of their kin. They share all the characteristics of all their kin that puts them in this giant group of flowering plants that are known as the orchids. Another kind of spontaneous orchid that could come out of nowhere, uh, a non-native that has naturalized. This one is not invasive, although it is native to Japan, it is not an invasive exotic. It doesn't displace, it hasn't shown any sign of displacing any native populations. It hasn't disrupted any native habitats, unlike the Chinese crown orchid, which has shown a propensity to displace native species. This one you'll find in lawns. It's not so much mulch adapted as it is lawn adapted. It's short enough to be out of the way of the lawnmower, so it can come up and grow to its full height of about three inches and still staying out of the way of the lawnmower. This is another one that we get photographs of pretty much every year. What is this? It's so neat looking. It is neat. It's a little orchid. It's a little helmet orchid. Again, not native, but not a problem. It has naturalized. That means it is now a part, a part of our otherwise native flora. It has it is reproducing itself in the wild, but it's not invasive in that it has not shown any propensity to displace native species or disrupt native habitats. At this point, Zeuxine, the last orchid that we looked at, starts with a Z, which means that we've come to the end of our A to Z of Florida Pinellas native and naturalized orchids. At this time, please do put some questions in the Q&A. You should have a little thought bubble towards the bottom where you can put your Q&As. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions except how to grow these things. I hope you don't mind. I try. I do try, but I don't succeed. Um, much better at finding and interpreting and photographing these things in the wild. A lot more information has been compiled into the only book of Florida wild orchids at the moment by Paul Martin Brown. Um, it's still available. We don't make any money on it, so I can talk about it all I want to. Um, on the cover of the famous ghost orchid, the dendrophylax that grows south of here in the corkscrew swamp. Names have changed. Yes, they have. Um, the common names have not. There's always a lot of consternation about how plant names change all the time. It's because we learn. The more we learn, we just need to apply the rules and names change. That's great. It means we're learning things. But thankfully, as frustrating as that might be, thankfully, the common names don't change, don't often change along with. So if you learn a common name, if it's actually commonly used, it should stay the same.
throughout. If you have any questions you think of after today's presentation, if you have any photographs of wild orchids that you might like me to um, help identify, please never hesitate to uh, email. It's my first initial and last name, J. Stevenson at PinellasCounty.org. Join us in two weeks' time for invasive plants. We'll take a look at those, those invasive exotic plants, those plants that have been introduced, are naturalized, and are disrupting our native plant communities. They are having a negative effect, and they are diminishing our natural areas. Looks like we do have a few questions, so I'll just open the Q&A and take a quick drink of water while I read them over. Three very good questions. Chris would like to know how many native orchids can be found in Brooker Creek. We have about 19 different species that are native in Brooker Creek. And that includes the little zooxine, the last one that we looked at, that Japanese grassy orchid. It includes, unfortunately, the Chinese crown orchid, that Eulophia graminea, which we have getting itself established. We're keeping our eye on it in the parking lot area. Uh, but we have the epiphytes and the terrestrials as well. So as many as 19 here in Brooker Creek. In fact, all of Pinellas native orchids are found on the preserve. And any others throughout the county, um, I don't think there's anywhere else in the county where all the species are represented other than Brooker Creek. I'm not just crowing because I work here. That's just a fact. Do giant orchids grow in the panhandle area? Yes, I'm pretty sure they do. Um, um, yes, what is it, Echristi Orthochilus, Orthochilus in the Panhandle, yes. Are there wild orchid walks scheduled anytime soon, Lynn wants to know. Sorry, Lynn, um, we will be starting up our um, second Friday botany walks in October. So the second Friday of every month, I think they're gonna start at 9.30 this year, um, from May, no, I'm sorry, from October to May. Um, as far as any particularly focused around just orchids, I'm afraid we don't, we in the person of me, doesn't really have that in my backpack of, of hikes. Um, if there are orchids, at the time of the hike, we will certainly look at them, but we don't have a one hit wonder because our orchids just don't behave like that. We get maybe one or one a month. And then anyway, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. What's my favorite species of orchid? That's so hard, especially for a botanist. I think I would lean towards that little ghost orchid, ours not the famous one, the little mosquito pollinated one. I just think it's hilarious. It's invisible. Um, it's kind of um, apocryphal. Um, and it, I was just telling my colleague this week that it's a little, it's a little, it's a little not, not with it, seems to love to germinate on dead sticks, not big, strong branches that are going to stick around for a long time. We're talking about twigs, less than the thickness of a pencil. That's where we seem to find the most of them. What happens in three years time? It snaps, rots, falls to the ground. That's it for the orchid. So live fast, die young kind of thing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really do appreciate it. I know it's kind of ghastly outside. I know it's the first day of school. Everyone's got lots to do. So I'm so thankful that you carved a little bit of time out of your day to sit with us and learn, hopefully, a little more about Pinellas native orchids. And we'll see you in a few weeks time and we'll go over invasive plants. Please tell a friend, please join us. And again, thanks for joining us today.